Studying the moon to Jupiter, we've talked about the Galilean moons. They're not the only ones there, but let's say a few things about these Galilean moons. So with that, we have now talked about the four biggest moons of Jupiter. Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. That's from farthest out to closest in. Or if you want to go from in and in to out, that's Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto. And the different natures of each one of them. Notice the outermost one is mostly icy. The innermost one is mostly rocky. In fact, there's no ice at all on, on, on Io. Uh, well, duh, it's going to be too, too hot for that. And then Europa is mostly rocky with a little bit of ice, okay? And then uh, Ganymede is, you know, about half, uh, 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 got more rock and then ice, okay? And then finally we get out here to Callisto and it's more ice than rock. And so the farther out you go, the more icy it is. Uh, the closer in you go, the warmer it is and the, the rockier it is. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like the solar system. This is like the solar system in miniature. And again, each of these worlds here is, is in fact, uh, and I say, the, I say worlds, the, the, these moons are worlds. They, they are like a microcosm of the whole solar system. So the outermost one is an even mixture of rock and ice. Okay, and then the next one has most uh, rocky interior, large area of slushy, icy stuff, followed by icy core. The next one in here is going to be mostly rock here with a very thin layer of, of ice on the outside and, and liquid underneath that. And again, the, the water layer is very, very thin. And then EO is so hot and so volcanic that the water's not at all stable there. Okay, but the innermost moons are caught in this tug of war between the gravity of Jupiter and the outer moons. So that makes the innermost moons much more, much more um, heated than the outer ones. Uh, so that makes them more active. Ganymede's probably heated a little bit and then Callisto is heated the least because it's the farthest one out. And this, that, that it is farthest out, and so there's least amount of gravitational tug of war going on with it. All these Galilean satellites have thin atmospheres in the sense that it's like Earth's exosphere. It's a sodium atmosphere for EO, uh, probably due to the volcanic activity, carbon dioxide for Callisto, and oxygen for Europa and Ganymede. Now, it's not oxygen from photosynthesis. It's probably because the outer parts of those moons are covered, coated in ice, and uh, cosmic rays and solar radiation hitting the water breaks it down into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen leaves, and the oxygen hangs around for a little bit and then leaves. All of these have weak magnetic fields. All have magnetic fields suggesting some sort of electrically conducting layer on the inside. For the outer moons, that's probably going to be salty water. For the inner moons, it's probably going to be liquid iron or nickel. Maybe for Ganymede too, we're not sure. Um, EO is the only one that doesn't have any water. Okay. Uh, the outer ones have some liquid water. Again, uh, heated to liquid state in, with with Clist or with 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 uh, Europa, uh, with Ganymede, and with uh, um, Callisto. It's probably pressed into liquid state. Yeah, possibly there's a little bit of heating going on in Ganymede too. So the, the Ganymede is a little more complicated. Um, and in fact, if you think about how the solar system formed that when the sun formed here, you had the proto-sun, the thing is going to be the sun, the inner part of the solar system was really going to be very warm, and so you got mostly rocky stuff, the outer part where the gas giants are, you ended up with ice and rock allowing planets to grow bigger. But in where Jupiter itself is swirling together to form, the inner part is probably going to be warmer and rockier, and the outer part less warm less rocky. Well, that, uh, that also fits exactly with the composition of these moons. The innermost one, Io, is all rock. The next one, uh, Europa, is mostly rock. And the outer two are a rock and ice mixture. And so, uh, in a sense, 
the Jupiter moons are a microcosm of the entire solar system. This raises other questions because it looks like Jupiter formed not like the rest of the planets. Jupiter formed more like a star would, directly condensing out the proplid. The moons of Jupiter, the big moons of Jupiter, formed the same way that planets formed around the sun. So this raises a huge debate about what do you call these worlds? Are they in fact planets? Or are they not planets? The definition we have for planet says it has to go around the sun, but these things formed like planets. They're planet sized and they got planet sort of things going on with them. Again, I like to call them worlds, uh, but I think that, it, that missing out on studying them is missing out on studying the solar system. Jupiter has a lot more moons besides just the Galilean moons. The Galilean moons, these four big moons that Galileo saw, uh, they are like a microcosm of the solar system. But Jupiter has dozens, several dozen other moons, little small tiny things, most of them just a few miles across, dozens of miles, tens of miles. Some of the biggest ones, you know, uh, less than 100 miles across. And so these things are tiny little specks, you know, by comparison. Uh, many of them, you know, even with their best telescopes, even with the spacecraft have been up close, don't see them very well. Uh, these are almost certainly asteroids or comets that have been caught in the gravity around Jupiter. Now, some of them may have been left over from the little Jupiter nebula that was forming the Galilean moons. That's possible. Uh, but others may be asteroids and comets that formed around the sun that got close to Jupiter and got caught. Remember, Jupiter is the biggest thing in the solar system with the most gravity, and it can hold on to these moons. It can hold on to all kinds of things and catch them and sweep them up. Uh, some of these things may have been flying around the solar system and could have potentially run into Earth or something, and Jupiter just grabbed them up uh, uh, with its gravity, uh, potentially. Uh, most likely, it's, not, it's a little more complicated than that, but you know, it uh, does raise some interesting questions as to Jupiter's role in the solar system. Is it fair to call them moons? Well, is it fair to call the moons of Mars also moons? Because Phobos and Deimos are also primarily captured asteroids, we think, rather than something that formed there. Uh, so these other moons around Jupiter are also primarily captured, we think, you know, unless a few of them formed in that Jovian nebula that was collapsing to form the uh, Galilean satellites. So we don't really know. It'd be really nice to study them more. Um, the uh, Voyagers just didn't really get a chance to study them hardly at all. Uh, many of them were discovered after the Voyagers had gone by. And then the Juno spacecraft, uh, which is there now, uh, is studying Jupiter more than the moon. So it does look at the moons, too. Uh, Galileo spacecraft definitely did not study these moons nearly as much as I would have liked. But remember, it was damaged uh, and uh, unable to send back a lot of the data at the rate that it was originally designed to do. And so that, that, that did negatively impact the science. And so uh, Jupiter's moons here still need a lot of study. And it would be fascinating just to have a mission to study the moons, not Jupiter itself, but the moons. It's very difficult to get funding to send a spacecraft just to study the moons, though, because the funding agencies tend to want you to study Jupiter, too. Um, and so, uh, but the moons themselves are like a miniature of the solar system, so I think it'd be really fascinating to study that. Since these moons are worlds, this raises the other interesting question. Could a bigger planet than Jupiter, because we know that some of the exoplanets are bigger than Jupiter, could they have a moon like Earth or Mars? Ganymede is nearly the size of Mars. So a bigger world could potentially have a bigger moon. And so uh, could that be possible? You know, maybe Star Wars was right about, you know, a uh, habitable moon around a gas giant planet. And so uh, that's something to think about. And so, again, this would be one of the interesting things. It would be nice if we could study these moons in greater detail.